we work U.S. military interest within the alliance. And that's everything from things that we want to see happen to things we are working with our allies. But our job is to represent U.S. military interest uh, in the alliance and represent the chairman. It sounds very political. It's a combination of both. For us, we try and keep it very pure, and, and it's military advice. And for the U.S. delegation, we're able to do that. You also have the political side, and that's with Ambassador Lute, and he represents the political uh, position of the United States. Because we are separate organizations, we have the freedom of action to actually provide that military advice that's not being influenced or pressured from a political side, if you would. If everything works the way it's supposed to work within our processes, we do the interagency, where you have all the elements of our government to come figure out what the final policy is going to be. And then when you have a military aspect of it, you have a political aspect, they're synchronized. And then we work that through the military committee on the military side, and then Ambassador and his folks work it through at the North Atlantic Council on the NAC side. It's one of those uh, really fascinating jobs because you're dealing with all aspects of not just the military advice, but understanding the political and the policy and all the other things that go with it. And then multiply that by 27 because you've got 27 other nations that are doing the same thing. NATO has relied heavily on the U.S. for leadership in the past and to a certain degree even today. How do we strengthen leadership capacity of other members in NATO? It's a great question, first of all. And there's really two avenues as I look at it after the last two and a half years of doing this job. One is within the NATO uh, international military staff itself at NATO headquarters in Brussels. And what I've seen over time if some of the newer nations or some of the smaller nations are actually getting some of these key positions within the military staff. To me, that's wonderful because it, it, it forces that, that interaction with all the alliances and it gives them the opportunity to kind of get that experience. When you look at today's environment, uh, especially with uh, the actions by the Russians in Ukraine and Crimea and some of the things that they've been doing uh, that have actually really concerned our eastern allies, you had a few nations up front, U.S. being one of them, that were kind of taking the lead. We've seen other nations now actually come to the forefront, like land units. We have other nations that are saying, hey, we'll provide the brigade for the very high readiness joint task force. We'll do this. We'll do that. Uh, U.S., hey, we'd like you to provide some enabler support, but this is a European issue, a European concern within the alliance. We need to be taking the lead. So we've actually seen some of the nations come up and do that. That's been a pretty positive aspect, especially when I look back two and a half years ago, you really did not see that. Still some challenges, though. Let's talk about defense budgets. How does this impact what we do in NATO planning? It's a huge impact. Uh, coming out of the Wales Summit, uh, there was an agreement by all 28 nations that we would uh, maintain at, as a minimum a 2% defense budget. Mm -hmm. And if we weren't at the 2%, for 2 we would strive to, number one, stop the bleeding and then over a time span of 10 years or so, get up to that 2% or better. We've seen some nations that have actually, especially when you look at our Baltic allies, that have, are almost at 2% or at 2% and working forward. We've seen other nations that have met the, uh, the agreement that was at the Wales Summit, and we've seen some nations that have come off the Wales Summit. It's a continuing, continuous dialogue that we have, and it's really on the political side. I mean, this is a political issue. It's about political will. It's about economies. Uh, it's, it's all that that goes into defense budgets. The same thing we go through within our internal system within the United States. The most important thing is not so much the money, but is the development of the capabilities, whatever those are, and those capability gaps that we have determined as we go through what they call NATO defense planning process. That's a continuous challenge, and it's something that uh, we, as a U.S. delegation, we will press, and especially on the political side that they will press. But because of uh, this past year, I've actually seen a a different direction a lot of the allies are going as they look at their defense capabilities. A lot of them are taking it very seriously. Are we pretty much on the same track, U.S. interests, NATO interests, European interests, or are there small little rubs? I would say in, in, the, in the big picture, yeah, we're on the same track. But understand that there are multiple threats to the alliance. It's not just what uh, Putin's been doing on the, the Russian side of the house. You have the whole issue of the southern flank illegal immigration, you have all this stuff that's going on in the south through the uh, Mediterranean, North African area. You have the Islamic ISIL and the things that they're doing, uh, and it's a direct threat to folks here in Europe. So we have a lot of common grounds. The key is how do you maintain that balance? Because you have to have the balance. You just can't throw everything in the one side or the other. It's got to be a balance to deal with the threats to NATO 360 degrees. From where you sit, the regionally aligned forces, 
that, that rotation, the heel to toe rotation, is it effective? Yes, absolutely. When we started doing the, uh, the reassurance measures, this is back, oh my gosh, almost a year ago, uh, the fact that we had regional aligned forces, rotational forces available was huge. UCOM and USER, most importantly, were able to remission them to other areas to do uh, reassurance exercises with allies that were wanting it and needing it. And so, yeah, absolutely huge. What are you learning in this job that should be, could be shared with the rest of the U.S. military that would make them a little bit smarter? I think number one is when you look at it from a military perspective with our allies, um, we have some great uh, allies and partners. Can't forget the partners. We're all of the same mindset for the most part. We know what's required. We know what needs to be done. We know about interoperability. We know about the value of training. The challenge, just like in any nation, to include our own, is, is the political will. And so put that aside and focus on the things that you control, which is working with your partners and your allies in the training environments that we are, or even in the operational environment. There's some strong relations, and it is about relationships. And we will struggle through the, the differences in types of equipment and technology, but we're getting better. And, and, and be, we're getting better because the last you know, 13 years that we've spent uh, dealing with the Afghanistan issue. Now we're at a, a critical point where we now need the transition to that next phase of, of how we do military operations as an alliance. And it's a two-way street. We learn from our allies and our allies learn from us.